Matthew 16, 18, one verse. Jesus himself speaking, Matthew 16, 18, the word says, and I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, everybody say Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my what? And the gates of what? Shall not prevail against it. All right, so last week was why God. This week is why church. Father bless us. Speak to your people. Young and young at heart, speak to them today. We be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Thank you, God, for this opportunity. May there be connectivity by the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, begging that, Lord, at appeal time, you will do your work. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, quickly, remember, we're living in a post-Christian. Everybody say post-Christian. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say post-Christian. We're living in a post-Christian society. Remember that now. Which means we're living in a world where the influence of Christianity is declining by the minutes. Post-Christian means we're living in a world where people say there are no moral absolutes, no ethical givens, no outright truth. Remember, post-Christian means your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. But even with that, last week we established that there is a God. Creation proves it, nature proves it, and the life of Jesus proves it. The text we use was in the what? Beginning. In the what, everybody? God created the heavens and the what? Now, that's what Genesis 1-1 says, but remember Genesis 1-26 says, and God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Then we go to the New Testament, and John 1-1 says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with whom? And the Word was whom? Then verse 14 says that the Word became flesh. So we've studied that, yes, there is a God. For those that want to refute that, my response is only God create, could create food out of thin air with two fish and five loaves of bread. Only God could walk on water. Only God could turn water into wedding punch. Only God could command a raging storm to stop. Only God could command demons to be hurled into the sea. There is a God because there's nothing that makes sense in the universe without him. There is a God because he has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. There is a God because Jesus lived, Jesus died, and Jesus rose again. Buddha didn't do that. Confucius didn't do that. Muhammad didn't do that. Scientists can explain that. Atheists can explain that. Agnostics can explain that there is a God. How do you explain something out of nothing? How do you explain a worldwide flood? How do you explain that a donkey could talk? That an axe head could float? That the sun could stand still? How do you explain how a red sea can become a dry highway? How do three men stand in a fiery furnace and not get burnt? How does a man lay down his life and then take it up again? There is a God. So we know there is a God, but the question now asks, why church? Why go to church? I hear people say all the time, I believe in God, but why do I have to go to church? After all, church is not a safe place anymore. Kids have been messed up for the rest of their lives because a priest, somebody they trusted, somebody they thought was safe, molested them. Why church? All they want is your money. We thought we were through with Restoration 40 Part 1. Now we got Restoration 40 Part 2. Why church? It's too long. They sing. They sing. And they still sing. Why church? All they do is preach damnation and hell and judge you. 
Why church? It's filled with hypocrites. Why church? They only care about numbers. Why church? The people are fake. Why church? Today, I don't know if you have your head under a rock or if you're in Never Never Land, but we're at a critical juncture in our world on the importance of going to church. And while most statistics say that 40% of Americans attend church regularly, the pollsters at Huffington Post posts say that that's not true. In fact, Huffington Post says that less than 20% of Americans regularly attend church. In fact, the only, the American, average American, only comes to church three times in his life. Number one, when he is born, he comes to be dedicated at church. Number two, when he is married, he walks down the aisle of the church. Number three, when he dies, he roll, is rolled in a casket in front of the church. So then people come to church three times in their lives when they are hatched, matched, and dispatched. But why church? And this question is particularly being asked a lot by our young people by millennials. They say, I can find my own way to God. I don't need the church. Why church? I can watch it on the internet. I can watch it on my phone. I can watch it on television. After all, Pastor Bird is breath of life. That's TV, so I can watch it on TV. Why church? I don't feel like dressing up. Why church? I don't feel like being hollered at. Why church? I'm sleepy, I'm tired, it's raining. I can stay in the dorm, in my apartment, in my house. Why church? It's not relevant. Why church? Church, we're living in a different world today. People are different now. People are tired of centralized structures. People are tired of revelation without relevance. People are tired of religion without relationship. People are tired of plastic, fake, phony, lifeless, flat, comatose ministry. People are tired of coming to church and getting beat up in the pulpit to get beat about, up about what you have on, to get beat up about what you're not doing. People are tired of fighting. People won't fight you anymore. Nobody wants to be in the church at war. They fight all week on their job. They're not coming to church for war, so they vote with their feet. People are tired of seeing emphasis placed on policy over the needs of people. People are tired of being able to come to church where they can share their burdens and problems, but they can't do it simply because they're afraid of what other folk might say about them after they come clean. People are getting tired of judgmental, legalistic, finger-pointing, fault-finding, holier-than-thou attitudes. People are tired of folk putting on an outside show for an unfriendly world. It's like the familiar story of the woman who was pulled over by the police. A man was being tailgated by a stressed out woman on a busy street. Suddenly, they're traveling on the street and the light turns yellow and just in front of him, he does the right thing. He stops at the light. Even though he could have probably beaten the light if he had placed his pedal to the metal and accelerating through the intersection, somebody knows what I'm talking about. Come on, say amen. But the tailgating woman who's behind him is furious because he stopped. So she honks her horn. She screams in frustration because she missed her chance to get through the intersection. And all the while, she drops her cell phone and her makeup at the same time. So while the lady is in mid-rant, calling her everything but a child of God, she hears a tap on the window. She looks up in her window in the face of a very serious police officer. The officer orders her to exit the car with her hands up. He takes her to the police station where she is searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. The woman is more furious. She now shouts some four-letter words, words you all don't know. Come on, say amen. She gives the officer a few choice words. After a couple of hours, another policeman approaches the woman and he opens her cell door. She's escorted back to the booking desk where the original arresting officer was waiting for her personal items. He says, ma'am, I'm sorry for that mistake. But you see, I pulled up behind you. And I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn flipping off the guy in front of you, cussing like a sailor. And as I looked at your car, I looked at your back bumper, and your bumper had a sticker that said, what would Jesus do? 
I then saw the follow me to church bumper sticker. I saw the chrome plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. So naturally I just assumed you had stolen the car. People are tired of folk who say one thing, but do another. People want a real, authentic, genuine experience in Jesus with real, authentic, genuine followers of Jesus. Do I have a witness in this place? And so the cry of why church is getting louder and louder. Why church is becoming more popular and popular. But in the name of Jesus, the Lord told me to tell somebody that the church is still the apple of God's eye. Ellen White, I still believe in her, says that it is still God's appointed agency for the salvation of men, women, boys, and girls. And so in these perilous days in which we live, where atheism, agnosticism, postmodernism, and even racism are increasing by the minute, I must stand in this pulpit. I must preach today and give you five reasons for why church. It may not be popular, but you can't be popular and prophetic at the same time. And so this is for the young and the old. Why church, Pastor Burr? Number one, God started the church. Matthew 16, 18, understand, we just read it. Jesus said, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of what, everybody? Hell shall not prevail against it. Now, don't miss this, because a lot of people read this text, and they take this text out of its context. Now, understand, Catholics will use this text as the foundation for their church. I am not hating on Catholics because I don't have to minimize somebody else to maximize myself. I'm speaking to the institution of the Roman Catholic Church. It sees itself as the extension of the New Testament Church. So you have New Testament Church, then you have Roman Catholic Church. Why? Because they believe Peter was their first pope. They believe Peter was their first pope based on this text. Matthew 16, 18, and I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So they believe Peter is the first pope. Petros, Peter, rock. But they got it wrong. Jesus is not saying in the text that Peter, Petros, is the rock on which the church was founded. But Jesus is saying that the church is built on him the rock, Christ Jesus. That's why we sing that hymn on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And so what Jesus is saying in the text is, I've established the church on myself, the living rock. The church was not built upon human wisdom not on sinful human beings. The church was not built on mortal flesh, but the church was built on the rock, Jesus. And because the church has been built on the rock, Christ Jesus, the church has stood the test of time. God's church, let me tell somebody, was here before you were born. And God's church, unless Jesus comes in your lifetime, is gonna be here when you die. In other words, the church was here before you got here, and the church is going to be here after you leave here. You got some folk that say they can't make it without me. The church won't make it without me. It will die without me. Don't be a legend in your own mind. The cemetery is full of folk who thought the church wouldn't make it without them. This is God's church. God started his church, and God's truth still moves on. The church is ecclesia. God's called out. God's not going to let what he started, what he's called out, to fail. Number two, why church? Because God said so. And if God said it, that sells it. Adam and Eve, God, why can't we eat of the fruit of all the trees that are in the garden? Because I said so. 
Why do we have to bring a, a lamb, a sheep, a goat without blemish to be an offering? Why can't we bring fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables? Because I said so. Noah, why must we build an ark? Because I said so. Why must, Moses says, I stretch my rod across the Red Sea? Because I said so. Why, Gideon says, do I have to reduce my army to 300 men? Because I said so. Why can't Samson, I cut my hair? Because I said so. Why do I have to keep the Sabbath? Because I said so. Why do I have to return tithe and offering? Because I said so. Why do I have to go to Oakwood? Because I said so. But let me bowl down somebody else's lane. Why do I have to work at Oakwood? Because I said so. Why do I have to go to church? Because I said so. Hebrews 10.25 is clear. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day of Jesus coming fast approaching. In other words, God is saying you got to go to church and you got to go to church even that much more as I'm getting ready to come. Now, God is sovereign. God can do what he wants, when he wants, where he wants, how he wants, and he doesn't have to ask you or me for permission to do as he wants. He's God. If God told you to do something, you got to do it. Quit asking all the questions why, just do it. God told you to obey him, do it. God told you to go to church, do it. And God is not a God who says, do as I say and not as I do. God told us to go to church because God went to church himself. If you look at Luke chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says, that it was Jesus' custom on the Sabbath day to go into the church, to go into the synagogue and read the scriptures. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, unless you think that this is just a ploy to get people to come to church, let me be clear, because I don't want anyone to misunderstand me today. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian, because there's a whole lot of folk that come to church, but they ain't Christians. I wish I had time. But you do have to go to church to be obedient to God. Are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? One day in seven, God has, has set God's standard for his chief people to assemble. So going to church is not just a good suggestion. It's God's will for his people. God didn't call us to gather and worship to burden us, but he called us to worship him to bless us. We should count it a joy to be blessed by God in God's church. Look at it now. Beginning of the semester, everybody in church, wait until we get down to October and November. And what troubles me is, think about all of the underground churches in other countries who only wish they could go to church and worship like we do. There's a story about a man who was explaining how his church, in his church, the people had to sing hymns. He was in China, no louder than a whisper because they were scared they'd be discovered. Because if they were discovered, it would mean physical abuse. Their children and possessions would be seized and they would be in prison. But even in the face of all of this fear, they still gather together. How much more should we, who have the pleasure, the privilege of worshiping and meeting openly in a palatial church, cushion pews, nice Taj Mahal restrooms, air condition? The Aeolians, video screens, microphones, pipe organ, Hammond organ, grand piano, keyboards, the preaching of the word. How much more should we come to church? Why church? Because God said so. Number three, I'm almost done. Why church? Worshiping God together is powerful. Now, now look at verse 25 again of Hebrews chapter 10. It says, not only should we worship together, but we should exhort one another. That we ought to encourage one another. There is something powerful, something powerful about gathering together with other believers to worship. Jesus said, wherever there are two or three gathered in my name, I will be in the midst. And let the record show, I may got two, 3,000 now, but my ministry started, y'all know my story, with two members. 
But wherever there are two or three gathered, God was in the midst, hallelujah. As humans, we were created to be relational beings. God never meant for a man to be alone in the garden. God, when he created Adam, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. So he created Eve. We're relational. That's why we talk. We're relational. That's why we smile. We're relational. That's why we hug. That's why we cry. We're relational beings. All of us long for community and connection with others. The internet is convenient. But the internet doesn't take the place of coming in God's house. Television is nice. Please watch me. But it doesn't take the place of coming together and feeling the power of the Holy Ghost that's in the room. Podcasts are wonderful additions to our spiritual lives, but they don't take the place of coming together in consistent Christian community through the church. We grow more together than we do alone. I listen to people, because people tell me all kind of stuff, okay? Pastor Burr, we need to have two services. One service for the young people and one service for the adults. And I always say, no. I say, no. And they say, well, why? I said, no. I said, if we get to the point we go to two services, we're going to have two identical services. Why? Because there is something that the young people glean from the older people when we're all together. And there is something that the older people glean from the younger people when we're all together. We grow more together than we do alone. The church does not mean a single individual lone ranger Christian just coming for Christian duties and never gathering together to worship with other believers. The church is community. It's worshiping with others, praying for others, hurting with others, serving others, being involved in the lives of others. And this is biblical and historical because the first followers of Jesus did this. They would get together to worship God together. Paul's letters were sent to all those New Testament communities that gathered in cities so they could read the letters in worship together. Church means getting together with other believers, worshiping God together, reading scriptures together, encouraging one another together. Somebody stood out getting this. Let me try it this way. Proverbs 17, 17 says, iron sharpens what? Iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Somebody knows that when iron rubs against iron, not only does it become sharper, but when iron rubs against iron, there are also, it causes sparks. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. When iron is rubbed together, something ignites. Something flickers. When iron is rubbed with iron, a fire is started. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. When I hear the Aeolian sing, it ignites something within me. When I hear a testimony, it causes sparks to fly in my soul. When I hear Sister Marva or Sister Dorothy, my church ladies, when I hear them shouting in church, I get fired up. When I hear John Stoddard play that organ and we sing marching to Zion, something is triggered in my spirit. Iron sharpens iron. Finally, number five, why church? Church is preparation place for paradise. Church is preparation for what we going to do when we get to heaven. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. In Isaiah 66, the Bible says it shall come from past, from one new moon to another moon, from one Sabbath to another Sabbath. Shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. When we get to heaven, we're going to worship and we're going to praise God. I'm going to praise God like I've lost my mind. When I get to heaven, I'm not going to be worried about who else is there. Some people when they get to heaven, they thought they would be there, won't be there. And those you thought would be there, won't and wouldn't will. But I'm here to let you know when I get to heaven, 
I'm just going to be happy that I'm there. Do I have a witness in this place? Let me tell you, I'm about to sit down, but I love to preach. I love church. I love hymns. I love anthems. I love gospel. I love it all. I love to sing. Y'all see me. They put the camera on me. Just as demonstrative in praise and worship, I'm just as demonstrative on a hymn. When we were singing today, marching to Zion, my soul got happy. I love church. I love to say amen. I love to shout. But I've learned we got to learn how to shout at the right time. It's good to have your prayers answered and have the things that make your life pleasing and comfortable. That's good. But shouting time is when we talk about eternity. Do I have a witness in this place? Shoes on your feet. Crazy socks on your legs. A roof over your head. Money in your pocket. That's good. We need them and they're great. But these are just common things in life. So don't let these things get you too excited. But when you hear about eternity, that through Jesus Christ, you're gonna live with him forever, that we're gonna have church all day long, all night long, that's time to shout. No more sickness, no more pain. That's shouting time. No more cancer. No more high blood pressure. That's shouting time. No more death. No more dying. No more disease. That's shouting time. No more house no. No more car no. That's shouting time. Mansion with your name on it. That's shouting time. Sit at the welcome table. That's shouting time. Feast on milk and honey. That's shouting time. Seeing that never get tired. That's shouting time. Put on my long white robe. That's shouting time. Eat grits with Jesus. That's shouting time. Eat rice and peas with Jesus. Thank you very much for tuning in to this week's Breath of Life broadcast. We hope and pray that you've been blessed by Dr. Bird's inspirational message. If you would like to hear this sermon in its entirety, please feel free to visit us at www.breathoflife.tv or call us at 256-929-6460. 